For 200 years, the King's statue has looked down upon an ever-changing scene along Weymouth's famous seafront. It is on countless postcards and features in so many books and guides. King George III first came to Weymouth in 1789. He had lost the American colony in 1776 and now feared a challenging war with Napoleon's France. And what did he think of Napoleon? I cannot but conclude you to be one of the most pernicious little odious reptiles that nature ever suffered to crawl upon the surface of the earth. Losing a colony and facing Napoleon would have been enough to drive anyone mad, but for much of his life, George was certainly not mad. He was incredibly conscientious. He took an active part in government policies, and he fathered 15 children. He was reasonably fit, well into his 50s, when an illness now known to be porphyria began to make him appear insane. Recent research has shown this to have been caused by prolonged and accidental arsenic poisoning. With his health starting to fail... George came to Weymouth in 1789 with his large family and entourage. The start of 14 glorious summer holidays spent here. He enjoyed visiting nearby Portland with his Queen Charlotte, and in 1800 they spent their wedding anniversary on the island. The King was highly regarded in Weymouth. In gratitude to his patronage, the town decided to commission a huge tableau statue of their monarch. This was to be made of a ceramic-type material invented by one Eleanor Code of Lyme Regis. Mrs Code had devised a remarkable formula using broken pots, crushed glass and flints blended into a ball clay. The resulting mixture could be very finely modelled and when skilfully kiln-fired produced a ceramic which was ideal for statues and monuments. It was extremely hard and almost totally resistant to weathering and erosion, so important on the sandblasted Weymouth seafront. The King's effigy, more than twice life-size, that's average height me standing by him, together with the magnificent lion, the unicorn, and the paraphernalia, was brilliantly sculpted in exquisite detail, as can be seen here. The statue was cast in Code and Seeley's London studio and transported to Weymouth by ship in 1804. It was eventually erected to face the rapidly developing esplanade on the site of the old town pond atop a huge Portland stone plinth designed by local architect James Hamilton. Princess Mary laid the foundation stone for the plinth in 1809 when corn, oil and wine were sprinkled on the mortar. The statue was unveiled a year later, 1810. The statue's natural colour was pale grey, but this was progressively overwashed with grey, black and dark green paint, all of which obscured the beauty of the moulding. No doubt this is why there were frequent calls for the whole thing to be demolished. It looked so drab. It could easily have met the same fate as befell these other statues of George III in New York in the 1760s. Transformation of the monotone King statue came in 1949 when sculptor Eric Morris was the first to apply heraldic colours, enabling the incredible detail of the work to be highlighted for the first time. 
The statue was refurbished 11 years later, but by the late 1960s it was in a sorry state. That's when my small involvement came in. In 1968 I was a young engineer working on the design of Weymouth first gyratory traffic scheme. This involved major alterations to the road layout and it was also the opportunity to give the old king a more fitting landscaped setting. As part of this, the then borough engineer, John Housigo, tasked me with organising the repainting of King's statue. We employed expert sign writer Mr Biles of Bridport to do the artistic work and to apply the large areas of real gold leaf to the lion and to other embellishments. The late historian Jack West researched the heraldic colours for us. It's interesting to note the subtle differences with today's scheme. On the back of the monumental plinth there is a large original inscription which we considered having recut, but it was much too worn. So stone carver John Selman of Nottington was commissioned to produce a much smaller replica on a stone plaque which we had affixed to the front of the plinth at ground level. In 1970 I borrowed a cherry picker hydraulic hoist to take these high level pictures of our traffic management scheme then in progress. It was a unique vantage point from which to see the recently repainted statue and the new paving and lawns. Interesting to note the many shops and businesses along Royal Terrace and Frederick Place, now long gone. Whilst the code stone itself withstands perfectly the seafront environment, sadly the paint and the gilding do not. By the 1980s, the statue needed a revamp, but lack of funds meant no gold leaf, so poor Leo had to make do with a dull khaki paint. Moving on to 2008, we can now welcome the first total restoration of Weymouth King statue in its 200 years. No superficial repainting this time. Twenty coats of grey, black, green and coloured paint have been removed from the pale grey code stone. Inside the hollow sections, stainless steel structural reinforcement has been added and the whole tableau has been strengthened. All credit to everyone involved, including artist Warwick Brown. It is only at close quarters that you can see the incredible workmanship and artistry of Code and Seely of so long ago.
but from afar you can appreciate the superbly aesthetic arrangement of all the elements. Those original designers really were brilliant. The story does not end there. Knowing they will not be able to afford gold leaf in five years' time, and with a Republican now on the books, the authority has decided that Weymouth's royal history is bunk after all. The lion will remain caged for health and safety reasons. And this has just been unveiled. On y soit qui mal y pense. Look it up.